Dr. Wright is a decorated and distinguished scholar of African American history and a gifted orator. Dr. Wright is the seventh president of Prairie View A&M. At Prairie View, he reminds his students that their education is not just a college degree, but also an appreciation of culture and knowledge of those that have come before them. To that end, Dr. Wright is an author of three books focusing on the African American experience in Kentucky, his native state. Additionally, he has published numerous articles, book chapters, and essays. His current work in progress is titled Robert Charles O'Hara Benjamin, A Forgotten Afro Afro-American Leader. Prior to taking the presidency of Prairie View A&M, Dr. Wright was provost of the University of Texas at Arlington, where he also was a longtime professor. Prior to that, he bravely ventured into another part of the South, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, where he served as vice provost for university programs and director of Afro-American studies. He held the William R. Kennan, Jr. Chair on American History at Duke. Dr. Wright's awards, among many, many others, include the Andrew W. Mellon Faculty Fellowship at Harvard University, and an honorary doctorate of letters from the University of Kentucky. At Prairie View A&M, Dr. Wright has painstakingly compiled a recommended reading list for his students that includes everything from Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, to Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, to Malcolm X's autobiography, to Stunkin White's The Elements of Style, the elements of style has nothing to do with Fashion Week in New York. <laughs> it has everything to do with writing properly. It is interesting reading for sure. And tonight we are honored to hear him share his own perspective on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George C. Wright to Rowan University. Thank you. Dr. Wright. Is Thank you so much. Good evening. It is indeed an honor to be here uh, at Rowan University, and I'm very excited. I'm actually going to stand up here. That mic won't be in the way. Uh, I'm actually very, very excited and honored to be here. I've been here about 24 hours, and I've had the opportunity to meet a number of students, faculty, and staff, and you have a wonderful, Mr. President, university community here. Uh, so I'm very excited. And included in the community, of course, is Emily Blank and Bill Carrigan. They were students of mine, first in my large American history class, and then in my Afro-American history class. And even though over a 13-year period at the University of Texas at Austin, I taught some 15,000 students, I got a chance to know Bill and Emily personally. Uh, we became friends. I can remember going fishing with them. On one occasion when I moved from one house to another house, they helped me move to my house and things like that. So I go way back with them. Uh, students, I'm not sure you realize this, but your university is to be commended for having this program on the significance of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that momentous piece of legislation that change the face of the United States starting in the 1960s, but even still has implications for today. Uh, I find it very interesting that there are many students, probably some right here, who take for granted all of the changes that the Civil Rights Act of 1954 brought about, and that is both a good thing and a bad thing. At the same time, there are many, not all, many Afro-Americans in this country, while they applauded the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, they were concerned that the act did not go far enough. And so when they think about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, they think about all of the things that should have happened that have not happened. Then there's another group. There are white Americans, to be sure, not all white Americans, but there are some white Americans in 1964 and thereafter that said this piece of legislation led to racial equality in America. Therefore, nothing else needs to be done. Passing the act was enough, they said. 
Many of these people believed, just as strongly as black people believed in an opposite way, that the Civil Rights Act leveled the playing field, and that if there's anyone who is not where they should be in American society, it is their own fault and not the system's fault. So you can see how many different Americans can see those things differently. But the fact that there are students who take the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for granted, the fact that there are black people who say the act has not done enough, there are some white people who say there's no need to do more, makes this program that we have in here tonight all the more important. As a scholar, but also as a person around at that time, to put it in context, uh, students, uh, what I find fascinating, of course, uh, being a history professor, when I started many years ago, it was like I was the uncle to my students. Then at a certain point, I was the father to the students. Now I am the grandfather to students. Uh, but to put it in context, so when I make certain comments, you'll know where I'm coming from. I was born in 1950, so I'm 14 years old uh, when the Civil Rights Act was passed. But what was it like living in the decade leading up to the 1964 Civil Rights Act? What was it like to live in America? Well. Obviously, there's a lot of different perspectives, but for this presentation tonight, I decided to go back to several. One of them, I went back to a book I read a number of years ago, and that is Tom Brokaw's book, America's Greatest Generation. Some of you probably read that book. Tom Brokaw talks about the men and women who became adults during the Great Depression and definitely during World War II. People who sacrificed greatly. And he talks about the common values these people had and the common sacrifices they made. He says at some point, during a time in their lives when they should have been concerned about raising families, when they should have been concerned about a lot of things, many of these people were dying or barely surviving in Austria, Germany, Italy, North Africa, or the coral islands of the Pacific in that regard. Then he talks about how these people came back, those who were fortunate enough to survive. And in the late 40s and 1950s, they started having children. And at the same time, these people would go to college. And colleges like Rowan University opened their doors to them, and they would be educated in numbers larger than had ever been seen anywhere in the world. And he talks on and on about these people, and he labels them America's greatest generation. Another perceptive person is, the other person is a University of Texas graduate, uh, broke, um, um, what's his name? Why am I slipping on his name all of a sudden? Uh, James Brawls, a University of Texas graduate. And he talks about graduating from college in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, he started his first job. And in his first job, he makes more than his father made after 30 years of working. And he talks about all of the wonderful opportunities. Well, what I find so interesting about those two views of America that were occurring in the 1950s and 1960s, those were occurring during the same time that my father and my father-in-law, people who also had fought in World War II. What those gentlemen should have said and talking about incredible opportunities in the 1950s and 1960s was that those opportunities were for whites only, or to really be specific, for white men only. My father and my future father-in-law were drafted out of high school in 1945 to go to the military. To be sure, they missed a lot of the major fighting of the Second World War. But nevertheless, they were veterans. They returned to Lexington, Kentucky. 
and thousands of people like them returned to other places in America after the Second World War to find the same segregated world that they had left behind. My father loved to read. I still remember that. Yet, as late as 1963, my parents and I could not go to the public library in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I can remember going to the amusement park in Lexington, Kentucky on Negro Day which was held twice a summer, and we would actually go on Negro Day. Now, the person I am now, I wouldn't go on Negro Day, nor would I go on Catholic Day or Woman's Day or something like that. If I couldn't go all the other days, I wouldn't, but I can remember looking forward to going on Negro Day. My father loved classical music, I wonder if he ever wanted to attend a concert at the University of Kentucky, or there was another university, predominantly white university in Lexington, called Transylvania University. These doors were closed to them. So if you think about it, this is reasons why the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was needed. Uh, as you all probably know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that has a number of different parts to it really had two overarching aspects to it. One was that it would address public accommodation discrimination, that it talked about giving people the right to go to hotels, motels, theaters, amusement parks, and places like that. Secondly, it talked about the right to vote freely, which was not the case in many places in the American South. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed on July the 2nd, 1964 by President Lyndon Johnson. But the background of that act is very, very important. I believe it's around, Bill can probably tell you the exact date, but somewhere around June the 11th, 1963, that then President Kennedy called for the passing of civil rights legislation to do the things that I've just mentioned. And so Kennedy, from June through November, was pushing that. But the act immediately ran into problems, first with the Judiciary Committee and then with the Rules Committee in the House of Representatives, where a strong anti-African-American Southerners, strong proponents of, of the continuation of segregation held key legislative positions. As you all know, President Kennedy was tragically assassinated. Well, immediately after Kennedy's assassination, the new president, Lyndon Johnson, met with a joint House and Senate, and in his very first words, he talked about the best way we can honor our slain president is not with some fancy memorial, not with some fancy eulogy, but by passing the civil rights legislation that Kennedy had so long to have come into existence. Johnson is able to push it along to where that same fall, actually I apologize, in February in February, two months after he became president, the House passes it. Again, Bill probably knows the specific. I suspect the vote was 290 to 120, something like that. It passes the House, but now it's in the hand of the United States Senate. And there the bill would be filibustered for some 54 days. Finally, a group of senators, Hubert Humphrey being one, Mansfield being another, various other people, they came up with an amended view of the Civil Rights Act, watered it down. This is one of the things that some African Americans would be upset about, but the amended version is much more acceptable, and then they move it out of the Senate Judiciary Group and take it right to a Senate vote. Ultimately, it passes something like 30, something like 72 to 37, something like that. Uh, the Joint House and Senate Committee then looks at it 
in late June, and finally on July the 2nd, 1964, Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. Okay.